One day, everyone woke up to the news that Princess Stella had arrived in Japan as the second princess of the Vermilion Empire and had been accepted into the Hagen Equestrian Academy with the highest grade point average out of all those who had been accepted. Among those who saw the news on TV was a boy named Ikai who aspires to be a strong knight even though his level is the worst ever and compared to Stella he has no chance against her. After Stella's arrival, newspapers and channels have been flocking to her like celebrities to get quotes from her. At that time, Ikai got dressed and left the house and wandered outside remembering his teacher's words to him son always remember dying is gay that as long as he feels discouraged about his low level it means he hasn't given up yet then he summoned his sword and practiced hard hoping to raise his level and fulfill his dream of becoming a magical knight after finishing his training he returned to his room again and was surprised to see Stella in front of him changing her clothes and when he saw her in her underwear he decided to take off his clothes before she yelled or scolded him to make them even which made her slap him then they went to the academy director Corona after she complained about him and said she couldn't excuse him after he deliberately undressed in front of her and when Stella entered the office, he apologized for the misunderstanding and told her that he was ready to do anything for her. Then he was surprised when she asked him to do Harakiri in exchange for her forgiveness. He told her that he wasn't willing to pay with his life for such a minor incident and that her request was unfair. Corona walks out of the office and leaves him alone with her. Stella approaches him and tells him that he will pay for sneaking into her room. He told her that this was his room too, so she calmed down after the office sprinklers were turned on. Then they were surprised when Corona came back and told them that they would be roommates from now on. Icky wondered how they could become roommates when they are not on the same level, as she is far above him, and Stella wondered that he had failed the academy tests, and he told her that he is an F rank and the only superpower he is good at is enhancing his physical abilities. Corona tells her that he is the weakest person in the academy and is nicknamed the worst. She then tells them that this is why she decided to put them in the same room together, since no one is inferior to Icky and no one is superior to Stella. Stella found that she had no choice but to stay with this loser in one room, but on three conditions, not to talk to her, look at her, or breathe next to her, and she would also allow him to live in front of the door of the room. Icky felt angry and that it was unfair because she did not want him to even breathe, thinking that he wanted to smell her. Corona suggested that they stop fighting and have a training fight, and the winner would have the right to set the rules for living in the room, and Stella was surprised to find him reluctant to fight against her, and told him that he had no chance against her, and he said that they wouldn't know the outcome of the fight if they didn't fight. Corona told them that the fight would start in an hour at the training ground, and that the loser would become the winner's servant for the rest of his life, and obey his orders no matter how silly or difficult. After that, Stella was preparing for the fight and remembered when she was in her homeland and her mother tried to convince her to change her decision to become a magical knight, but she aspired to become a strong knight so that she could serve her homeland and her people and vowed to destroy Ikki as the first step in realizing her dream. As she walked out of the room on her way to the training ground, her classmates were all staring at her, wondering why a girl like her was fighting a mock fight against the worst of the worst, and Corona was wondering why he had agreed to fight against Stella. Ikki tells her that he has to beat her in order to win the annual Seven Stars Fight Festival and graduate, even if his GPA is as low as usual, because he trusts that she will participate in the fight festival when the time comes. Stella then entered the training ground, and when she stood in front of him, she advised him to stop trying to become a magical knight as his ability level was not promising. He told her that he had no intention of quitting or leaving before her duel, and she realized that he was the kind of person who believed that hard work could equal talent, and she remembered when she had defeated someone in the past in a crushing defeat because he had the same belief. After that, the fight began and each of them summoned their swords. Then Stella attacked first and Icky kept blocking her fiery attacks and marveled at his ability to keep up with her blows and movements. And when it was his turn to attack, she was surprised that he stole her technique and style to confront them, telling her that he hadn't learned anything from anyone for a long time, so he had a talent for using other people's techniques against them. Stella decided to make a fake attack to get at him, but he managed to block her blow with the hilt of his sword and then managed to hit her in the shoulder, but he retreated when he realized she was about to transform. Form. The aura of magic began to come out of Stella's body, and she decided to mix her magic with her sword abilities to be able to overcome him, and she concentrated all the flame power in her sword, creating a fiery dragon inside her blade, and began to attack him to finish him with one blow. But she was shocked that he suddenly became faster in movement, and kept dodging her blows until he got close enough to her, and struck her with a blow that was enough to decide the fight in his favor. After that, Corona announced Icky's victory against Stella to the surprise of everyone present, then they both 
lost consciousness after the end of the fight, and when Stella regained consciousness in the Academy Hospital, she realized that she had long forgotten the feeling of defeat and remembered it now at the hands of Iki. Kurono told her that he was exhausted, having used up all his magical energy in the last minute of the fight, but that his life was not threatened. She wondered why someone like him was considered the weakest and worst of the Academy's knights. Kurono told her that the ranking is based on the students' abilities as mage knights and that combat and physical abilities are not included in the evaluation, and although no system can fairly assess Iki's abilities, he still believes in himself and never stops improving and advised her to follow in his footsteps if she wants to hone her skills. After that, she went to her room where Iki was and apologized to him for judging him as a loser because she always despised people who put her in a specific frame of a genius girl, which is why she decided to go abroad to study, and if she had seen the truth about his strength, she would not have lost the fight in this way, and she was shocked when he reminded her of the condition of the fight, and that she must now be his maid and obey all his orders for the rest of her life, so she tried to justify the matter and retract her challenge, but he provoked her by saying that she is from a family that cannot keep their promises, so she felt angry and agreed to do all his requests and orders, and thought that he would ask her something perverted, but he smiled softly and asked her to become his roommate to be close to her. The next day, they woke up early in the morning to train before class at the academy, and Iki told her that he goes jogging 20 kilometers every day, and that she doesn't have to accompany him if it's hard for her, and that she has enough magical power to compensate for any lack of physical abilities. She refuses and insists on training with him in a competitive spirit to improve herself. She notices that he seems to be in a good mood today, and tells her that his sister is enrolling in the academy today, and he will finally get to see her after four years without meeting her. The teacher introduces herself as Yuri, and tells him that she's a new teacher at the academy, and looks like the female version of L, not an intelligence of course. She then told them that starting this year, the academy's representatives to the Seven Star Fighting Festival will be chosen based on their fighting abilities, not their average ability score, as has been done every year, and the duels that will determine the academy's representatives will begin next week. When Stella asked how many duels each student would have, Yuri replied that each student would have more than 10 duels, one every three days, and Iki realized that he would be able to use his special technique since he was only allowed to use it once a day. He realized that Yuri wanted to give everyone a fair chance to show off their abilities, and that students who don't want to fight can withdraw and it won't affect their grades. They were surprised when she had a sudden hemorrhage and lost consciousness during class. After she was taken to the academy hospital, she told them that she vomits a liter of blood every day. Stella realized that this is the reason for her emaciated appearance and the dark circles on her eyes. Eki then told her that he was able to get into the academy thanks to her because she was the one who accepted him. Stella then asked how he was admitted to the academy, and he told her that before he enrolled, there were no standardized criteria for students' abilities. As they were talking, they were interrupted by the sound of a classmate named Kagami rushing towards Iki at full speed to have some time to talk to him. She tells him that she's in the same class as him and is his biggest fan. She admires his performance in his first duel against Stella and says she's thinking of starting a news club at the academy and wants to publish an article on the front page of the newspaper, but he tells her that he's not that important. Stella became jealous and sarcastically asked him to accept her offer and interview her for the article. He asked Kagami to continue their conversation about it later and followed Stella when he heard his sister Shizuku's voice and kept looking around until he found her. He approached her and told her that he had intended to look for her and meet her after all these years, but he and everyone around him were surprised when she rushed towards him and kissed him, so Kagami rushed and photographed the moment to get a scoop. Shizuku told him that a kiss is a sign of affection between two parties, so Stella picked her up and threw her away, then scolded him for allowing this to happen in front of everyone, and when he called her name, Shizuku realized that she was the princess that everyone was talking about, and wondered why she got in her way and prevented her from approaching her brother, and told her that she had nothing to do with it. She was just a princess from a neighboring country. Stella had to tell her that she is Iki's maid, and this allows her to interfere between them, and all the students were shocked when she said this out loud, but she continued that Iki has the right to demand anything from her, even if it is sleeping in the same bed with him. Shizuku, feeling jealous, decides to leave him alone and summons her sword to confront Stella. He tells her that she can't do that in the academy lobby, but soon finds that Stella also summons her sword in response and accepts her challenge, and the clash between them begins, causing serious damage to the academy. They then went to Principal Corono, who decided to punish them by cleaning the bathrooms for a week instead of suspending them, and for a week they continued to clean the bathrooms, exchanging verbal insults all the time, without getting bored. Shizuku tells her to stay away from her brother forever. Stella tells her that she can't promise that because they're roommates, and it's inappropriate for her to want to make love to her blood brother, so she says she can never understand Iki's personality because she's not a family member. Stella denied that it has anything to do with their sibling bond or not. Shizuku then asked her if she could understand what it feels like to be treated as if she never existed, as Iki did, and left in silence, leaving Stella with many questions in her head. After that, Shizuku 
returned to her room and met her roommate Naji while Stella waited for Ikki to return after training, then hesitantly asked him if he had been treated badly in the past and realized that Shizuku had told him, so he told her that his story was kind of depressing. Then he began to tell her that he was a student of his grandfather, Ryuma, the hero who led Japan to victory in the last world war, and the man he aspires to be one day, and their family was famous for their knights and magicians, and because he lacked talent for a young age, all his relatives and family completely ignored him and treated him as if he didn't exist, so he couldn't even find a seat at family gatherings and events. One year he couldn't take it anymore, so he decided to run away from home and go away, but the weather was so bad that he found himself lost, and when he realized that he might die, his samurai grandfather Yuma appeared in front of him and told him that his frustration at being the weakest was proof that he hadn't given up yet. He picked him up, told him not to give up, and told him that if he had the courage, he could become anything he wanted. Although they were just words, Ikki felt that they saved him from falling into a pit of despair. From then on, Ikki decided to be a man like him who could support and encourage the weak as he did, which is why he wanted to become a powerful magical knight. Despite everyone's refusal to train him and take care of him, he used to train alone. When he enrolled in the academy, his family members were furious and tried to pressure the administration to expel him. The director of the academy, who was in charge at the time, decided to create special rules to prevent him from graduating. Although the director has been changed, he expects the harassment will continue, but he doesn't intend to give up anytime soon. Meanwhile, Shizuku tells Nagi her story about her brother and how she always loved him even after he left home. But when she realized how badly her family treated him, she began to despise them and decided to give him all the love he was missing. Nagi tells her that he understands her discomfort with strangers and that her relationship with her family has made it worse and that he knows this because he is in a relationship with someone who looks a bit like her and asks her to come talk to him whenever she wants. A few days later, Iki and Stella were practicing sword fighting for the upcoming Star Fight Festival qualifiers. After they finished, he asked her about her opponent for her first match, and she said it was a student named Momotani. When he started telling her information about him, she stopped him and said she wasn't the type to want to know about her opponent in advance. Iki realized for a moment that they were quickly becoming close despite their differences. Their conversation was interrupted by the bell for first period, and as he was about to leave, Stella wanted to invite him to go out on tomorrow's date as it's a weekend. But before she could finish her sentence, Iki received a message on his phone. She thought it was mail from the academy with the identity of his next opponent, but she was shocked to find that it was a message from Shizuku asking him to go out on a date tomorrow, and what's more, he agreed without hesitation and sent her a reply right away. The next day, Iki and Stella met with Shizuku and Naji. Shizuku was surprised that a princess like her was interested in spending her free time with common people like her and her brother, but Stella justified her presence by saying that she wanted to take a tour of Japan and learn more about it. Iki wonders who Naji is, and she tells him he's Shizuku's roommate and invites him to join them. Iki can't tell if Naji is a guy or a girl, so he tells him he's a guy with a virgin's heart, yuck. After that, they started walking around the malls, and Stella felt angry when she saw Shizuku holding Iki's hand as they walked. She told her that it was normal communication between brothers, and when she felt like holding his other hand, Shizuku accused her of having feelings for Iki. She was embarrassed and denied it. Meanwhile, the center's guards were doing their job by monitoring the cameras until they were surprised by a mysterious person breaking into the surveillance room and attacking them. Then he and his gang members began to penetrate the center, while on the other side, Iki and the others were having lunch at a restaurant, and Shizuku was surprised when he approached her to remove the food from her face with his hand. So Stella filled her face with food and got a beer like Santa Claus, but she was disappointed when Iki went to get a towel. He then went to the bathroom with Nagi and was surprised that his sister trusted him quickly and told him a lot about their family, as she is always sensitive and shy with strangers, and thanked him for taking her as a friend. Their conversation was interrupted when they heard suspicious footsteps outside the bathroom. Then one of the gang members broke into the bathroom after realizing that someone was hiding inside and opened fire indiscriminately, and his colleague told him that the boss had ordered them to take any civilians as victims. When they didn't find anyone inside, they had to leave the bathroom after one of them took off his mask and threw it away. Naji and Aki came out of hiding and realized it was a gang that was robbing them all. Naji summoned his sword and Aki realized that he could use the element of darkness and control shadows through it and move from one place to another. When they went to the control room, they found the guards tied up and unconscious after being drugged. Aki called director Kurono to check if the news about the robbery of the mall had spread. Kurono tells him that the police have arrived and have the place surrounded and that the gang is a group of magic users who have demanded a large sum of money for the release of the hostages, but she thinks they want more than money. She decides to give him and his companions permission to use swords and magic outside the academy at the request of the police for help. On the other side, Stella and Shizuku are among the hostages being held, and Stella notices that they are deliberately holding only women and children hostage. Shizuku whispered to her that she had a plan to get them out of this predicament, but she needed time and asked her to distract them until she was ready. 
Then they found one of the gang members assaulting a woman and her child, and when he pointed his gun at the child to get rid of him, Stella used her power and saved the child from death. The criminal was furious and continued to shoot at them, but to no avail, as the bullets did not affect her dress, and she approached him and told him that she had no intention of eliminating them, and then the leader ordered this criminal named Yakin to lower his weapon. Then he showed respect to Stella and introduced himself to her as Bishau, then scolded Yakin for assaulting a small child, then pointed his gun at his mother and told him that the misbehaving child is not to blame after all, it is the parent's fault. Stella realizes that he intends to kill the woman unjustly, so she rushes towards him and summons her sword. She realizes that it is a trap to lure her towards him, and he uses his strength to block her strike and then hits her with a punch that almost kills her with its force. He then told her that his technique is the ring of justice, a crime and punishment technique where blocking her strike is the crime and striking her is the punishment. He admired her for risking her life for the common people and decided to give her a way to save their lives as a reward by apologizing to him on behalf of the child while kneeling on the ground, stripped of all her clothes. Meanwhile, Iki and Nagi were watching from a safe distance. Iki was irritated by Bishao's request, but he had to wait until the right moment when Stella started undressing in accordance with his order. Iki couldn't help himself and almost ruined it with his rashness, but Nagi used his ability and restrained his shadow to prevent him from moving so as not to expose them. He then tells him that his sister is making a magical barrier without anyone noticing, and all Stella is doing is buying her time. After she finishes making the barrier, she uses her power to create a huge wall of water that separates the hostages from the gang. When Bishao realizes that there is another witch among the hostages, he orders them to get rid of everyone. The gang members started shooting at them, but the bullets couldn't penetrate Shizuku's water. Eki appeared, summoned his sword, and used his full strength to land on the gang members from a high altitude, then targeted Bishou and managed to cut off his left hand. Bishou was furious, and when he ordered his men to shoot them, he looked around to find that Stella had eliminated all of them and only he was left. Then Eki rushed to her and hugged her to apologize for his delay in attacking him. To their surprise, a woman was hiding among the hostages, carrying a gun and threatening to kill the hostage if they took any action. Naji ordered Bishou's shadow to be freed, but she was quickly attacked by an unknown source and immediately lost consciousness. A mysterious man named Kirihara appeared out of nowhere, but he already knew Iki. After some time, the police caught up with the gang and rescued the hostages. Fans began to gather around the heroic Kirihara, who finally stole the spotlight, and Shizuku and Stella agreed that they felt uncomfortable with this eccentric person. Then Iki approached him and thanked him for saving everyone. He told him that he had to help the weak and began to mock Iki's ambition to become a magical knight and is still studying at the academy. Stella was furious and defended him. Kirihara asks him to tell her that he ran away in the past for fear of facing him in a fight and that he is nothing but a useless coward. He then asks him to check his email, and when he does, he finds that he has received a message from the academy stating that Kirihara will be his first opponent in the qualifying tournament for the annual festival. A few days later, the qualifying stage began to select the academy's representatives for the annual seven-star fighting festival, and Stella was able to defeat her first opponent in a crushing defeat. When she returned to the room, she found Iki watching a clip of Kirihara's previous duel to study his movements and was unable to detect his presence with his super technology, but he couldn't find a loophole. He then thought that if Stella was his opponent, he would have withdrawn from the fight because she could bypass his blind spot with her ranged attack and told her that he had never fought anyone with a ranged attack and his fighting style is far from chivalrous, so everyone calls him a hunter. Stella was worried about Eki, but he told her that he had found a way to take him down and was confident of winning the fight. As time went on, Eki trained hard, thinking that he had no choice but to win until he met Naji along the way. Naji then asked him about the nature of the relationship between him and Kirihara, and Iki told him that there had been contact between his eldest family and the academy administration last year in an attempt to expel him from the academy, and Kirihara found him an easy target, so he offered him a duel and convinced him that the teachers would recognize his ability to fight when they saw him fight. Despite Iki's refusal to fight, Kirihara did not stop provoking him and kept attacking him to force him to face him, but he insisted on his opinion and refused to use his sword in order not to respond to him, and Naji realized that his true strength lies in endurance after all the abuse he had gone through until he no longer listened to his inner cries and hoped that someone would appear one day and hear his cries for him. The next day, Eki met with his comrades and still had an hour until the start of the fight, so he decided to sit in the waiting room, and when he went there, he signed a document that he agreed to fight in the playoffs, as it was a real fight and would put his life in danger. A girl named Ning was standing behind him and was impressed by how quickly he made such a critical decision. He didn't hesitate like the other students and told her that he had been waiting for the right opportunity to fight a real fight for the first time, and she found that he knew a lot about her, such as her name, that she knew Kurono, and that she was a part-time instructor at the academy. She approached him and offered to give him a private workout tonight, but was quickly surprised when Kurono stood behind her and scolded her for trying to lure one of the students.
hands. Then she drags her out, as she is supposed to be supervising the fights herself, but she hangs around like a teenager. Then Eki sits alone and prepares to enter the duel, remembering everything that he has gone through in his life until this moment. Then he felt a strange feeling when he heard his name and that he should go to the arena now. Then he went out into the arena in front of the crowd and stood in front of Kirihara, who began to taunt him and underestimate him. Then they each summoned their weapons, and when the fight began, Kirihara turned the entire arena into a forest with his technology and disappeared as if he had never existed in the first place. Iki stood at attention, thinking of a way to beat the technique, and kept dodging his arrows until he was able to locate him and rushed to attack him and engage him closely. But Kirihara managed to evade him and found that he was really trying his best to win the fight. Iki told him that he could shoot as many arrows as he wanted and he would continue to block them. Kirihara disappeared again and said that he would tell him where to shoot from to challenge him to block, then shot him in the right thigh and left arm. When Iki was unable to block his arrows this time, he told him that he has the ability to shoot arrows that are imperceptible and are not felt by the opponent until they penetrate his body. Meanwhile, his comrades felt that he was in trouble after his plan against Kirihara failed, and Stella wondered why he did not use his full ability from the beginning of the fight despite his hard preparation and training. Naji told her that he couldn't do it, and because he couldn't make such an easy decision, he became nervous and didn't know what to do. But suddenly Stella remembered his words to her that he would be fine and would be able to win, and she realized that all this time he was nervous and acting strangely, and she didn't notice it even though she is the closest person to him. Kirihara, on the other hand, continued to attack Eki and inflict serious damage on him, and never stopped making fun of his ambition to win the annual festival in order to graduate from the academy, and some students laughed at the idea of an f rank student aspiring to win the Seven Star Fighting Festival. Eki listened to the laughter and sarcasm of the others in Kirihara, and tried to withstand the physical and mental damage until he hit him right in the heart and knocked him down, then incited everyone to cheer him on and chant the phrase, the worst. Stella became furious and couldn't contain herself until she yelled at everyone to shut up and stop making fun of her favorite knight, and scolded Eki for giving up so quickly and forcing him to get back up. So Eki got back up, punched himself, and thanked her for her encouragement. He then decided to use another strategy to break Kirihara's arrows. He used his extreme technique and began to remember all the arrows he had received in order. When Kirihara fired his arrow, he focused on all the details around him and was shocked when he was able to block his arrow and break it with his fist. Then he continued to block his arrows without seeing, hearing, or feeling them before they hit him, and he was able to locate him by the tone of his voice, so Kirihara tried to defend himself desperately, but Eki launched at full speed, aiming directly at him, so Kirihara kept running away with all his ability, but there was no escape before the blade of Eki's sword, which stopped a millimeter before finishing him when Kirihara admitted defeat. After that, Eki was declared the winner of his first official fight and qualified for the next round, and then he looked at Stella with a smile before he lost consciousness after losing a lot of blood and draining his energy. And when he regained consciousness in the hospital, he found Stella next to him sleeping on the edge of the bed, and after she woke up, she felt embarrassed because he was staring at her all the time she was sleeping. He apologized to her for embarrassing himself and making her feel anxious about him, and was surprised when he told her out of the blue that he loved her and was happy that fate had brought them together. So she asked him to close his eyes, and when he did, she kissed his cheek. He realized that she wanted to tell him that she loved him indirectly, so he hugged her and asked her to always stay together and reach the highest level of horsemanship, and they agreed to joust in the final of the annual festival, and she told him that she would not lose against him next time. Two weeks later, Eki continues to defeat his opponents in advance in the playoffs, winning five matches in a row, and is no longer seen as the worst of the worst, but as an uncrowned king. Kagami and some of the girls ask him to teach them sword practice, while Stella is jealous of all the female fans gathering around him, and his fellow boys are jealous that he's getting all the attention. The next day, Stella tells him that it would be generous of him to agree to train talented girls who have a bright future in horsemanship, and he tells her that he wants to teach them so that they can protect themselves if anything happens to them. She felt a little embarrassed and went back to reading her magazine. She thought about telling him what she thought about two weeks after their date, but soon she turned around and found that he had fallen asleep. The next day, he started training Kagami and her companions, but she was more interested in taking notes and information to write about it in her articles. Then they were interrupted by the joining of the rest of the boys, feeling hatred towards him and making fun of him for gathering girls around him while he was just a loser. Then one of them pulled out his weapon, which was a pistol, and Iki was able to beat them without resorting to his sword, and then they realized how strong he was and knelt in front of him to ask for forgiveness. Then they told him that they invite him that he had the attention of all the girls in his class and wanted to become as strong as him and asked him to give them some lessons in training, and Iki humbly agreed to help them improve themselves. After that, the boys and girls train together under his supervision and he becomes very popular as a trainer, which impresses Stella. While they are talking, she wants to give him some water to show her interest in him, but she is surprised when Shizuku joins them and gives him a juice before she does. Stella was 
was furious and had to drink two bottles of water on her own. Then Shizuku asked him to teach her swordsmanship, and when he told her that their family had a sword master who could handle it, she said that she hated her family and didn't want to learn anything from them after they abandoned him. Stella got jealous and asked him to teach her too, even though she was twice his level, and when she sensed that he almost didn't agree, she pretended that she said it to see his reaction and walked away in anger. After she was alone, she met Naji who was looking for Shizuku and noticed that he was holding something in his hand. He told her that it was an Otome game that he had borrowed from one of his classmates, and Stella noticed that one of the protagonists looked very much like Iki. After that, Stella spent most of her time playing the game, and she quickly integrated into the game because of the hero's resemblance to Iki. Even his voice sounded very similar to him, and Stella was enjoying her time. Then she felt longing to do the things that all lovers do with him, such as walking around together, hugging, and kissing. But when she heard his voice in the room and realized that he had been there for a while, she panicked. He told her that he would have to take Shizuku and the other girls to the pool tomorrow as part of their fencing practice and offered to go with him. He told her that he refused because their styles of fighting are completely different. His style is based on deception, while she has absolute strength, and he fears that it will negatively affect the strength of her sword if he trains her in his style, and he asked her to be the one who always exceeds his expectations. Stella felt that he really cared about her, so she decided to accompany him on the pool trip tomorrow. She sat next to him, feeling happy. When they arrived, he told his students that the goal of the training was to enhance lung capacity, and for each of them to feel very close to themselves and listen to their inner voices, while a mysterious girl was watching him from a distance. Meanwhile, Stella was sitting far away from them, wanting him to spend some time with her, and then it occurred to her to try the same exercise to listen to her inner voice, and she realized that this is the basis of the Ikki technique and thought that she would get closer to him if she mastered it. She was interrupted by the sound of a girl talking to Ikki, causing some water to seep into her, and she almost drowned. When she resurfaced, she realized it was Kagami asking him how far he and Stella had come. Stella denied that they were dating and was surprised that Kagami wanted to go on a date with him to find out more about him, so she had to admit that they were lovers to leave him alone, and Kagami promised to keep it a secret between them. On the other hand, Nadi was giving Shizuku some advice to get closer to her brother, while Kagami was doing the same with Stella, especially after realizing that it had been two weeks since they confessed their feelings and there had been no progress in the relationship. When Eki sat down with her, she felt hesitant and awkward and asked him what he thought of her swimsuit, to which he coldly replied that it looked good. Then he told her that he wanted to talk to her about their relationship and what they should do. She thought he wanted to break up with her because she was acting cold and not doing anything to prove her love for him. When she confronted him about it, he told her that he didn't want to break up with her, but that he loved her and wanted to have romantic moments with her. After a while, the situation calmed down and he suggested that they say at the same time what they were thinking of doing at the moment. They then told each other that they wanted to kiss each other and finally did it. On their way back, they were sitting next to each other holding hands like normal lovers until they received messages on their mail, and it turns out that in their next matches, they will face the two executives of the student council. The next day, the fight between Eki and his opponent Renren Tomaru, who was using her technique as a runner to run at full speed, creating a storm around Eki, clearly affecting his vision as he stood still, ready for the next move. On the other side, Seiju swung his sword to gather weight and make it heavier so that he could take out Stella in one fell swoop, and at the same time, the two were crushingly defeated by the super duo, their techniques useless against them. Afterward, the mysterious purple-haired girl kept watching them from afar. When Eki gathered with his comrades, he told them that he was being watched by someone, then looked at the tree on the other side of the lake and asked her to appear and tell him what she wanted. The girl realized that she had been spotted and ran away, but she tripped and fell into the lake by mistake. When they saved her from drowning, she told them that her name was Ayas Ayatsuji, a third-year student. Aiki asked her if she was related to Kaido Ayatsuji, and she told him that he was her father. Stella wondered about this Kaido and Shizuku told her that he was a talented swordsman known as the Last Samurai, who had won all the known swordsmanship tournaments, but was not famous because he did not use magic in his fighting style. Eki was very excited about meeting the daughter of the man he learned swordsmanship from and watched as a young boy, and when he asked her how he was doing, she said that he had an accident in a fight and was hospitalized. Shizuku then got to the point and asked her why she had been watching her brother for a whole week. She told them that she wanted to get some advice from him about swordsmanship, but she didn't know how to talk to a man she didn't know. Eki told her that he wouldn't mind if she joined his training team, and over time she started practicing with him using wooden swords. He told her that he felt the reason she wasn't improving was because she felt she wasn't up to her father's standards yet. He then told her that trying to imitate him would prevent her from improving because they were of different genders, and suggested that she correct her movements to suit her physique and began to adjust the position of her legs. After that, Ayas felt the difference in the movement of her legs. He told her that she would soon get used to it. When she attacked him, she noticed that her movement was faster and better than before, and she admired his genius and called him a professor of fencing. In the evening, Stella was as jealous as ever of Ayas's closeness to Iki, and when
When she asked Shizuku if she was angry too, she was surprised by her response that she would be happy even if she wasn't his partner as long as there was someone else to make him happy as well. Ayas, on the other hand, offered Ikki to train her from now on as she feels that she will become stronger under his guidance as she wants to win the qualifiers and qualify for the Seven Star Fight Festival. The next day, Ayas trains with Stella and notices that her level has improved significantly after correcting her movement. After they finish training, she decides to invite them over for dinner as a thank you for their help. She then tells them that since she started training with them, she feels that she can become closer to her father's level. They were interrupted by a few boys joining them after seeing Ayas, including a cocky boy named Hirado. When Eki asked them to leave quietly, Hirado noticed that he looked like a swordsman and said that he just wanted to say hello when he saw a familiar face. Then he gives him a bottle of juice as an apology for his rudeness. When Eki is well-intentioned, Hirado surprises him and mocks his lax defense despite being a swordsman, and seems to enjoy his time insulting him, challenging him to a duel here and now that the restaurant has been evacuated. Stella was furious and almost attacked him, but Eki stopped her, telling her that his hand slipped and there was no need to fight. Karado laughed at his peaceful reaction to what he had done, then approached him and spat in his face. Stella wanted to smash his face, but he stopped her again, so Karado gave up and decided to leave. Eki tells Stella that he can't cause trouble in a public place, and if he goes along with them and uses his sword, he will be expelled from the academy as he is not confident that he can beat Karado without it. Then they are surprised when two mysterious people join the conversation. One of them tells Iki that he guessed correctly about Karado's strength, as he is a Donro Academy star and was a top 8 finalist at last year's festival. When Stella asks about them, Iki tells her that they are Hagen Academy Vice President Yutakata Masogi and Kanata Totokubara, and Yutakata then treats the wound on Iki's head. After they left, Iki told Ayes that he would like to help her as a friend if she was in trouble with these people, but before she could answer, they received messages on their mail and found out that they would be facing each other in the next match of the Academy qualifiers. A few days later, Ayas no longer goes to training with Iki and his friends, and in the evening Iki receives a message from her that she wants to meet him on the roof of a building because she needs his help. When Naji reads the message, he tells him that it might be a trap and that he should prepare to end his friendship with her in case anything unexpected happens, so Iki decides to go to meet him to find out for himself, and when he goes there, he finds her waiting for him. Iki asks what she wants from him, and she says she heard about his promise with Stella to duel again at the annual festival, and asks him what he would do if he had to face an unbeatable opponent. She then summoned her sword, and Iki was surprised to see her throw herself from the top of the building, so he had to use his technique to catch up with her before she fell to the ground and then changed their direction to fall into the water. After that, he realized that she was planning to force him to use his technique, since he is allowed to use it once a day and their duel will start in 10 hours, and he won't have time to retrieve it, making it more likely that she will win. Iki wondered why she wanted to win so much, and Ayase didn't want to tell him the reason, and said that she would beat him no matter what, then she just walked away, and when Iki got to his room, he passed out in Stella's arms after losing his strength. Iki woke up the next day in the hospital and found his comrades next to him. When he looked at the clock, Stella told him that he still had time until his match began. Then Corona joined them and asked him to go with her to see something, and then he realized that she knew about the destruction he caused to save Ayas, so he said that he was willing to accept the punishment but could not tell her the details. She told him some information about his opponent Ayas, and that her father became unable to wield a sword again after he lost to Corrado in a one-on-one -on -one duel. The terms of the match were that Kido's family property would go to Corrado if he won, and after the duel Kaido was in a coma for two years. Meanwhile, Ayes sat next to her father, remembering all that Corrado had done to her and the harm he had caused her, and vowed that she would qualify for the annual festival so that she could fight and defeat him, and when she remembered her father's advice, she promised him that she would return everything they had lost. Nagi then realizes that this is what makes her so strong and desperate at the same time, and warns Iki that she will do anything to beat him in the fight, so he asks Stella to accompany him because he needs to do something before the duel begins. When the time came, Eki stepped into the arena to stand in front of Ayas, and everyone in the audience was excited about the match between master and disciple. While Ayas was impressed by his appearance on the arena, even though he was unable to use his technique and thought he was going to retire, Stella wonders about her abilities, but Nadi tells her that this is her first year of official competition. Her abilities and technique are unknown, and that her skills will determine the outcome of the fight. When the fight started, Eki started to attack, and Ayas tapped the hilt of her sword with her finger, and hit him with a powerful attack without moving from her place, and everyone was surprised at what just happened, while Ayas continued to attack him and tear his body apart. Eki realized that she must have set several traps without him noticing and attacked him through them, and when Naji thought about it, he realized that she had broken the rules by setting traps earlier. Ayas, on the other hand, was trying to attack him and lure him into one of her traps, but she was surprised that he managed to dodge it, so she took advantage of the opportunity and hit him with another trap, severely damaging his left 
arm. Ikki had to defend against her throughout the duel until she almost gave him a fatal blow, but he blocked it in time with the hilt of his sword, and then he realized that his suspicions were correct as he asked Yuri to overlook Ayasa's deliberate breaking of the rules because he trusted that she would do so, and when she asked him why, he told her that he wanted to confirm his true feelings if he wanted to end his friendship with her or not, as he would lose the fight if he ended his friendship with her. He then told Ayas during the fight that she is deliberately ignoring everything he taught her, and that her movements and fighting style are erratic because she is trying to deceive her soul and create an evil person inside her because of her pride. She said she doesn't care about principles and values, and will do anything to win and regain what her family has lost. Ikki decides to end the fight in his own way and rushes towards her and dodges her traps using his perfect vision technique. Ayas plants her sword in the ground to use all her traps at once and he can't dodge it, but he jumps towards her and starts to hit her. When she blocks it, she realizes it's just a shadow and Ikki manages to dodge it and deliver the knockout blow, but at the last moment he switches his sword form to the illusion so as not to cut her. It was then that his companions realized that he did not intend to finish her off and that he had planned from the beginning to drain her energy so that she would be unable to move at this time. Ayas realized this when she was unable to continue fighting, and when he asked her if she had found her soul through her pride during the fight, her sword disappeared and she realized that she had been deceiving herself all along. Eki offers to help her regain what she has lost and tells her that she has lost her way a little, but she hasn't failed her father yet, and she feels as if she sees her father standing in front of her and helping her, so she asks him, crying, to help her. Ayas begins to tell them about her father, nicknamed the Last Samurai, telling them that he stopped swordsmanship when she was in middle school due to a heart condition, but continued to teach his students. Two years ago, Ayas's father had been training her to master his secret technique, telling her to never forget her pride, to help the weak, and to hate evil. Ayas realized that her father didn't have much time left before he was defeated and put into a coma by Karado. Stella gathers information about him and finds that he deliberately breaks into and destroys schools and martial arts training centers around the city and is known as a sword eater because of his dueling style. Ayas tells them that when he challenged her father two years ago, he didn't need to use special techniques. Eki realized that this is why he is called the last samurai, and Ayas remembered the day Kaido fought against Karado, which was like a nightmare for her. On that day, she kept begging him to stop the fight, but he remained steadfast in order not to let Karado hurt her or one of his students. Karado mocked his principle of fighting to protect people, and the fight continued between them, and Kaido continued to receive severe beatings until he decided to use his own technique and end the fight in his favor, but Karado gave him a knockout blow, after which he fell motionless. Ayas felt angry at Karado and regretted that she didn't duel him instead of her father and stop him and blamed herself for what happened to her family. In the present, Ayas arrived with them to her father's former home and found that it had become full of chaos after Kurado and his followers took over and was no longer the home she knew. Ikki then went inside the house to meet Kurado and challenged him to a one-on-one -on -one duel to take back Ayasa's house. Kurado mocked him for having high spirits compared to that day when he bullied him at the restaurant. Ikki pulls out all the fake ID cards that belong to him, and Kurado accepts the challenge and summons his sword-eating weapon, and when Ikki summons his sword, he attacks him and Ikki keeps blocking him until he wants to use the opportunity to hit him, but he is surprised that Kurado blocked him even though his timing was correct. Karado continued to attack him even at a safe distance, and Stella realized that the fight would be difficult for Ikki due to his inability to engage with an opponent outside his range, and they continued to exchange blows until Karado managed to injure him in the abdomen after dodging him. Ikki guessed that he was using the technique with which he was able to beat Kato, which is the speed of reaction, and began to analyze his ability in detail. Karado was impressed that he managed to discover the secret of his technique in his first battle against him, but even so, he will not be able to surpass it because it is a trait he was born with. He then returned to attack him again and used his maximum speed to make it difficult for him and managed to injure Ikki in the chest. And Ikki survived a deadly attack after he stumbled in his steps and kept trying to keep up with Karado's speed while smiling. Stella realizes that he's having a great time fighting a strong opponent like Karado, and when Ayas tries to go towards them to stop the fight, she stops her and tells her that she won't get her family home back if she does, then asks if her father was humiliated. Ayas replies that they would have lived happily if Karado hadn't broken into their lives and taken everything away. Stella says that Kato found pleasure in fighting Karado after he was disqualified due to his health issues and lost the ability to do the thing he loved. Ayas realizes that he apologized to her before he passed out because he got carried away with his emotions and sacrificed everything to face a strong opponent and relive the days of the past. As the fight rages on, Stella realizes that Karado's weakness is that his stamina runs out quickly. Ikki then wanted to ask Kato if he was able to smile while facing them as they are now, and Kato told him that if he wasn't enjoying their heated fight, they wouldn't call him the last samurai. Ikki decides to finally end the fight and tells Ayas that they'll get back everything they lost. They each use their techniques to their fullest, but Karada was surprised that he doesn't try
try to dodge his long-range sword strikes and run straight at him. When he got close enough, Aes realized that he had used her father's technique, and when she asked how he had learned to master it, Stella told her that he had used the sword-stealing skill as he had used the other swordsman's technique. Then Corrado turned to him and asked him his name, and when Iki told him, he left the house saying that they would continue their fight at the annual festival and that he didn't need this place anymore. After he left, Ayas apologized to him for having to fight because of her and that she didn't know anything about her father and what it meant to live her life as a knight. He told her that he was able to win because she remembered her father's technique, that no one understands Kaido better than she does, and that she deserves to be the true successor to the last samurai. So Ayas decided to do her best to become stronger and can confidently say that she is her father's successor. After Ayas reclaimed her family home and returned it as it was, Iki and Stella left, then told her that Ayas admitted to the judges that she cheated in their duel, so they removed her from the ratings and banned her for 10 days. Then he received a letter from Ayas telling him that her father had finally regained consciousness after two years in a coma, and he felt relieved and realized that things were back to normal for the Ayas family. A week later, Eki continues to advance in the playoffs and reaches his 12th win, so the headmistress decides to invite him and Stella to a training camp as a break in Okutama, and Stella is happy that they will get some time alone. Shizuku, on the other hand, was frustrated after her attempts to stop them from traveling alone failed, and Naji intuitively told her that they weren't going on a nice private vacation trip. Meanwhile, upon arrival, Iki and Stella were surprised by the presence of the Hagen Academy student council members. Then Renrin challenged Stella to a game of tennis, but their style of play had nothing to do with tennis, as it was more like a battle between a dragon and a tiger. Then Canada told him that they did not come here to play and have fun, but rather to clean and prepare the training camp, as the student representatives will come to the camp in a month from now. Stella realized that the student council's tasks are very boring and that she should cooperate with them in finishing the camp. Then Yu Takata said that the student union president would like to meet Eki, but she is absent from working with them today. Kanata told them that she would come late today, and Stella was furious that it was no longer a trip just for her and Eki. Meanwhile, Shizuku returned to her family home and was greeted by her pet cat. After Eki and Stella finished helping Kanata and her friends clean up, they decided to go to see the waterfall up close. They were told that President Tuko would arrive in an hour. On their way to the waterfall, Eki noticed that she was exhausted and told him that she had eaten two large plates of food during lunch, which made her feel stuffed. He offered to take her back to the camp, but she refused because they finally had some time alone, so they continued on their way to the waterfall. On the other side, Shizuku was watching an album of Eki's photos from when he was a child until the maid interrupted her and told her that her father was waiting for her downstairs. In the evening, Stella continued to suffer from her heavy body and insisted on continuing on the road. She told him that she felt dizzy, heavy, and wanted to vomit, then thought she might be pregnant because of the kiss she had gotten from Ikai earlier. Oh. Iki tells her that it's impossible for that to happen and guesses that she might have caught a cold and decides to head back to camp. Unfortunately, it starts raining and someone is watching them from afar. They head to the nearest mountain camp to stay until it stops raining. He finds that she has a fever and a high temperature, so he suggests that they take off their wet clothes so that it doesn't get worse. Stella tells him that she's not upset that he's hot for her, and he says that he wants to tell everyone that he loves her proudly before they make love. Stella realizes that he is serious about their relationship and interrupts their conversation. Eki receives a call from colleagues to check on them, and the mysterious person watching them receives orders to start executing the plan. On the other side, Shizuku met Itsuki's father and asked him to get to the point as she returned home after receiving a letter from her mother, and he told her that he made her write the letter because he trusted that she wouldn't read it if it was his letter and did so because he wanted to make sure she was doing well living on her own. Itsuki then admires her for doing well in the annual festival qualifiers and winning 12 consecutive wins, an accomplishment that makes him proud. She says that her brother Iki did the same thing, but he doesn't care about it at all, and goes back to her room. Meanwhile, Iki was sitting alone after Stella fell asleep and felt a sudden vibration as if something had hit the hut. He went out to check things out and saw a giant stone monster waiting for him, and as soon as he saw it, the monster crushed the hut underneath him. Iki manages to save Stella by using his top speed, then puts her aside, summons his sword, and turns the monster into crumbs of rock with one blow, but to his surprise, it has the ability to reshape itself into a bunch of rock monsters. One by one, he began to take out the monsters until one of them managed to inflict significant damage. When they noticed Stella's presence, they ignored him and headed towards her. That's when the Hagen Academy student council members showed up to offer their support and Renren Ren managed to carry Stella away, while the rest of them took care of the monsters. Icky thought that maybe someone is controlling these monsters that won't stop rising no matter how much damage they take, but Yu Takata told him that it's probably the work of the steel wire user. Then President Tuka appeared and told them that the monsters are connected by magical powers, so they have to follow the chain until they find the person controlling them. Then she used her super strength to crush the monsters and eliminate them all at once, and then they all turned into a huge rock monster again, but it 
could not withstand her overwhelming technology. Then she sent her light attack through magical powers to the person controlling the monsters and severely damaged him. His boss told him that there are several ways to intercept this type of attack. Then she stood on top of the pile of rocks left by the monster and Iki realized that she is Princess Tuka, one of the top four in last year's annual festival. Meanwhile, Shizuku received a message from the academy that her next opponent will be Tuka. A few days later, the news spread in all the newspapers, and when they learned that Shizuku's opponent in her next match would be Tuka, they felt that it would not be an easy match for her, but Nagi was confident that she would do well since she could use the purest water in her magic, which Tuka could not connect with electricity. Stella decided to go check on Shizuku and asked her if she was feeling any nerves. She replied that it wasn't to the point where it would affect her concentration on the fight. She told her that Eki was worried about her and didn't want her to push herself during the fight and that she was only coming to watch her for support. After that, she and Nagi thought that Eki wouldn't be worried if Stella was Tuka's opponent because he was confident in her abilities and felt that she wasn't strong enough and decided to make an effort to become stronger and have the right to be close to him, and she would prove it in her battle tomorrow. The next day, Shizuku went to the battlefield, fully prepared to face Tuka and decided to fight with all her might to show Eki that she was strong enough. Eki realizes that Shizuku doesn't want to make the first move due to the danger of Tuka's special technique that can cut through any opponent in close proximity with her faster than light sword. Shizuku then turned the arena into an icy ground and started attacking Tuka from a distance. So Tuka rushed towards her and started exchanging attacks with her until Shizuku managed to bind her with ice and hit her with a giant block. Then everyone was amazed when Tuka broke the block and turned it into crumbs thanks to her strength. While Shizuku marveled at her ability to respond to her attacks, even though she supposedly attacked her from her blind spot and wondered if Tuka was able to see something. Shizuku wondered when and how she had managed to hit her, and soon she received another blow that almost killed her, and then Tuka realized that she had used her water shadow to dodge the blow. Although the two had an equal fight at first, Tuka had the advantage due to her tremendous speed in moving and attacking, and the injured Shizuku could not keep up with her, so Iki realized that she could not read all her moves due to her limited mind, and Tuka had skills that only a demon princess could master. Hirano joins him and tells him that she was a student of Nango Tarajiru, the god of swordsmanship, and he realizes that his sister has no chance against Tuka's technique. Stella shouts and encourages Shizuku to try her best. Shizuku didn't care about Stella's encouragement, but vowed to do more than her best to win and qualify for the annual festival with her brother and his friends. She used her power to heal her wounds and then decided to attack this time, even if she couldn't see her movements. Shizuku started attacking with all her might, while Tuka dodged her attacks at high speed until she got close enough to hit her with a crushing blow, but she was surprised that it was just a watery shadow, and then a bunch of Shizuku clones appeared behind her and kept getting rid of them one by one. Shizuku then covered the entire arena with fog, which had a clear effect on Tuka's ability to move freely. Shizuku continued to attack her from all sides, and when the decisive moment came, she rushed towards Tuka to settle the fight in her favor. But she was shocked when Tuka used her trump card and delivered a knockout blow without realizing it, removing all the ice and fog related to her powers in a flash. Then the commentator announced the end of the fight between them with Tuka's victory, and Iki realized that his sister's last attack was not a suicide attack, but the best move towards victory. After that, Shizuku regained consciousness and found her comrades next to her, and when she realized that she had lost the fight, she asked them to leave her alone for a while. Iki and Stella left quietly and said that she would be fine as she was now stronger, while Naji remained sitting next to Shizuku and refused to leave, then hugged her and asked her to unleash her feelings in front of him and not to pretend to be strong anymore. A few days later, the Academy's newspaper published the photos and names of the top candidates for the annual festival, Iki, Stella, and Tuka. The principal called Iki into her office to ask him if he had heard about an old man named Akaza from the International Magical Knights Federation. He told her that he had met him a few times when he lived in his family's house and was a subordinate member of the family working under his father. Corona said that he was trying to find out a secret about the Academy and that his father seemed to be the one instigating him to do so. Iki thought that Akaza might be doing it on his own because he always hated him, so Corona realized that he might hate Iki's family because he is a sub-member, which makes him feel inferior, and decided to do her job of protecting the students and the Academy's secrets. Stella goes to the student council room and finds Tuka tripping over one of Yu Takata's magazines and scolds her and Seiju for not putting things back where they belong and making the room untidy. Noticing Iki and Stella behind them, she greets them and apologizes for not introducing herself properly. Stella finds that her personality is very different from what she imagined, and they all go to a social welfare institution and find the children giving her a warm welcome. Yudakata told them that they grew up in a place similar to this in Fukuoka and that they used to come and visit the children whenever they had the chance. One of the children recognized Stella because he had seen her picture on TV and the children crowded around her and asked her to play with them. While Stella and Renren were enjoying their time playing with the children, Iki 
was preparing food with Yutakata and Tuka, then thanked her for saving them that day and having a strong fight with his sister, and realized that he knew the secret of her technique as she deliberately took off her glasses so that she could not see and enhance the power of her technique, known as reverse vision. Afterwards, she tells him to rest while she cooks. Ikki realizes that for some reason he can't take his eyes off her, and Yutakata tells him it's because he's looking at Tuka's essence and the source of her power. She then told him that there are more complicated things than Tuka's power, and told him her story as the story of a child whose parents caused his soul to die inside until he became so aggressive and broken that he hurt Tuka several times, but she didn't give up on him until he became human again. Then she added that Tuka's goal in life is to make everyone smile and give them memories to support them in difficult times, which is what she always tries to do with children, and Ikki realized that she is using her ability to support others, and that is the source of her strength, which made him wonder about the source of his own strength. In the evening, Ikki and Stella return to the academy and are surprised to find their classmates running towards them. They find that a photo of them kissing has been published in the academy's newspaper, and it has gone viral all over the country because Stella is a foreigner. Akaza joined them in his fancy car and asked Ikki to accompany him to the ethics committee hearing. When they arrived at the International Magical Knights Federation headquarters, Akaza and the ethics committee members started questioning him and asked him about the time he and Stella started dating. Ikki told them the whole truth and denied that they had done anything inappropriate during her time in Japan, saying that he loved her and was serious about his relationship with her. After a while, he was detained in a special cell until they continued their interrogation tomorrow. The next day, Stella continued to advance in the festival qualifiers, winning all of her matches, and everyone was whispering about her secret relationship with Ikki. The interrogation continued for four days, and he was surprised that they decided to play his remaining qualifying matches at the interrogation headquarters instead of the academy. Ikki managed to win the fight with difficulty, and the news was published in newspapers and websites. Stella felt guilty and thought about breaking up with him so that he could return to his normal life again. Shizuku was furious at her idea and attacked her in the restaurant in front of everyone. She then tells her that her brother is dealing with this difficult situation because he refuses to accept the fact that his relationship with her ended in a disgraceful way. She remembers what he told her when they were at the cabin and says that she would never forgive her if she betrayed him and left him in such a situation. A week later, Iki won his 16th match in the playoffs, and when he was exhausted, his opponent approached him and put a small handkerchief in his pocket without the guards noticing, and when he returned to his room, he found that Stella had sent him a lock of her hair. He realized that she was doing her best at that time to keep their promise and win the duels to meet him at the annual festival. During the interrogation, he asked to meet his father to present him with proof of his innocence. The next day, they allowed him to meet his father, and when he went to him, Itsuki expressed his admiration for his progress in the qualifiers and that he was doing well. Iki realizes that the source of his strength is getting praise and recognition from his family, and that this is why he left home and took risks to become stronger. So he asks his father if he will recognize him if he wins the annual festival. Itsuki understands that he thinks all the time that he is shunned and not recognized as a family member because of his weakness. He tells him that he is wrong in his belief because he has always been recognized, but he thinks that teaching him techniques when he does not have the talent is a waste of time and effort. Then Iki was shocked when he told him that all he has reached so far is the average strength of his full abilities, and that this is the worst thing that can happen to any member of their family, and Iki began to see things around him in red color out of anger and despair. Then his father continued that helpless people will have useless confidence when people who are supposed to do nothing have the ability to do something, and Iki realized the bitter truth that his father didn't hate him, that he never had any feelings or hopes for him, and that his relationship with him was ruined from the very beginning. After that, Eki continued to live his life between investigating and winning fights, dead inside after meeting his father until 18 days into his detention at the Union, when Akaza told him that his opponent for the final match would be Tuka, the student union president, and Akaza told him that this duel would determine his fate as a magical knight. Iki sat alone thinking about how he should beat Tuka with his empty, worthless sword after remembering his father's words to him, while Tuka called Shizuku to her room to tell her that she suspects they deliberately set up a match between her and Iki to put pressure on him and put him in a vulnerable position. She adds that she knows how bad he is mentally and physically, and that he won't give up to fight against her, so she asks her to suggest that he withdraw from the duel because she will fight with her soul and strength to beat him, and does not intend to use any devious methods. Shizuku went back to her room thinking about it and asked Naji if she really should do that. Naji replied that she was the only one who could answer the question since she was the only one who had accepted Iki into her family and had a prior knowledge of how strong Tuka was. Tuka, on the other hand, wondered if she would feel proud to qualify for the annual festival if Iki withdrew or if she fought him when he wasn't 100% ready and Yu Takata told her to do her best and fight in a way that would make her proud. The next day, it was time for the much-anticipated finals from which six duelists would qualify to represent the Academy at the annual festival in the most exciting and anticipated of the six matches
matches was Iki and Tuka's match, which everyone called the duel of the century. Meanwhile, Corona was furious that Akaza had managed to pull off his scheme to get her, and thought there was only one way for Iki to prove that he was right, and that was to win the duel. Akaza joins them and sarcastically tells them that because Iki hasn't arrived at the arena yet, the match will be cancelled and Tuko will be declared the winner 15 minutes after his absence. Corona reminds him that the Federation promised that they would bring Iki in a special car, and he tells her that he left on his own earlier, at which time Iki suffers alone, walking on his feet despite his weakened strength and low spirits, remembering his grandfather's words to him in despair. Then, to his surprise, another version of him appeared nearby, telling him that this man had been planting irresponsible words in him all these years, and he had chosen to take his words seriously and live beyond his abilities until he ended up carrying a lightsaber that no one wanted. This version of Iki was trying to discourage him, urging him to stop persevering, to give himself a break from fighting, to give up the idea of facing Tuka. But then hope flared up in his heart, and he felt as if he had the ability to see the sunlight again. Then he regained consciousness in the arms of Shizuku, who told him that she did not want him to go to fight Tuka, but believed in him. Then he found all his teammates cheering and encouraging him to overcome Tuka and believe in his strength. And when he saw Stella standing in front of him holding her qualification medal for the annual festival, he gathered his courage and strength to fulfill the promise he made with her. If he arrives on the battlefield and Tuka has no choice but to defeat him despite his pitiful condition, she tells him that his injuries and condition will not prevent her from giving it her all and fighting with all her might. Iki told her that he had no intention of looking disgraceful in front of her and would fight with everything he had. When the fight started, everyone was surprised that he immediately used his special technique, while Stella realized that he had decided from the beginning not to use any tricks to defeat her and wanted to have a clean fight. They began to think and anticipate each other's moves in order to be able to avoid them and deliver the knockout blow. Then they rushed towards each other and Iki used all his strength and physical energy to put everything he had into one attack to decide the fight until he was bleeding from different parts of his body from the strength of adrenaline flowing through him. Then it ended in front of everyone's eyes as Tuka's sword shattered and fell motionless while Iki stood steadfast and raised his hand high, declaring his overwhelming victory in the fight and on the other side, Akaza was standing empty-mouthed, not realizing that he managed to win the fight despite his condition and the strength of his opponent and with one blow. Hirono told him that he had exhausted everything he had in one sword swing instead of a minute as he used to do and that he would not have defeated her with his special technique alone. Then Master Nango, the god of fencing, told him that what was inside him was beyond the extreme limits and could not be withstood by a human being. Akaza was furious and left the stands, grumbling about the outcome of the match. He headed towards the arena with his axe in hand to attack Iki, but was quickly struck by Stella's sword, who rushed into the arena to meet Iki after waiting for him. As soon as he saw her in front of him, he tried to hold on because he had something to say to her. When he tried to lean on his sword to approach her, it disappeared and he almost fell, but she caught him and told him that he did a good job in his fight and deserved to win, and told him that she loves him because of the way he is. Then she hugged him in front of everyone, and Iki realized that the warmth he felt now was what saved him from falling into the pit of despair and darkness, and he decided to ask her to marry him in front of everyone, and she was overjoyed and agreed to be his wife amidst the celebrations of the crowd. Meanwhile, Itsuki received a call from the Emperor of Vermilion, Stella's father, after the whole world witnessed the official union of their children, and asked him not to involve their children in adult troubles and to live their lives in peace, and Itsuki agreed with him. A few days later, Akaza was fired from his position and Eiki spent some time in the hospital recovering from his injuries, and with the passage of time, he became normal again, and Principal Corono announced the six candidates to participate on behalf of the Academy in the annual festival, and everyone recognized Eiki's power as a magical knight. Then Tuka announced that he would take over the leadership of the student union next year amidst cheers and cheers from everyone. Toka then asked him to come and give a speech as the new president and told him that she felt very proud of him at this moment, and asked him to take the Academy to the top of the Seven Stars Festival, as everyone has high hopes for him. Eki realized that the feeling of being recognized and having a good impression of him is a beautiful feeling. 